Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Brian Hoskins, and I'm chair of the Grantham Institute at Imperial here. And on my own behalf and behalf of the directors, uh, Professor Joe Haig and Martin Siegert, I'd like to welcome you all to our eighth Grantham Annual Lecture. Uh, this is the big uh, event, of, biggest event of our year, and we have had some excellent speakers in the past, and today's speaker certainly stands up to that great record. And it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Mary Robinson to, to you as our eighth Grantham Lecturer. She is uh, president of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. Now, Mary was the first woman president of Ireland for seven years from 1990, and then UN High Commissioner for Human Rights until 2002, and then founder and president of Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative until 2010. And she spent most of her life as a human rights advocate. So she trained in law, and she became an academic in that area, but also a barrister, and also a member of the Irish Senate, carrying on three jobs at once. And she sought to use law as an instrument for social change. And she argued landmark cases before the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court in Luxembourg, as well as in the Irish courts. She has received many honors, and amongst those, the Presidential Medal, Medal of Freedom from President Obama, a member of the Elders, a former chair of the Council of Women World Leaders, and a member of the Club of Madrid. In 2010, Mary Robinson returned to Ireland and now serves as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice. In 2014, she was appointed the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on Climate Change. Now, with all that, it's impossible to think of anyone in the world more able to address the subject of climate justice. Why is it relevant in 2015? And please welcome Mary Robinson to give the 2015 Grantham Annual Lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Could I begin by saying I'm really delighted to be here and indeed honored to give the eighth Grantham lecture. And I just wanted you to hear my voice and know that um, I do have quite a heavy cold. At breakfast this morning in the Skoll Forum, I suggested that my voice was quite sexy, and that went down well. So <laughs> as long as you find it sexy, that'll be, that'll be all right. I was reflecting that uh, when I served as President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, coming close to 30 years ago now, we were a people about to embark on fast economic development, ben benefiting from the solidarity that came with being a member of the European Union. In fact, when Ireland joined the European Union in 1973, some parts of the country were considered developing, including my beloved County Mayo. As president, I led trade delegations to the United States, to Japan, to India, and elsewhere, as we attempted to attract investment, to create decent jobs, to build better health and education infrastructure, and to advance development. What I didn't have to do was raise money to buy land on mainland Europe so our citizens could move there because the rising sea level was threatening our very existence. What I didn't have to do, either as president or as a constitutional lawyer, is to consider Ireland's territorial sovereignty in light of the threats posed to our island by climate change. Yet, this is what President Tong of the Republic of Kiribati is doing. He calls it migrating with dignity. In Geneva in early March, I participated on a panel at the Human Rights Council with President Tong. He described vividly the threat to his people's very ability to remain on their islands posed by climate change. He has bought land in Fiji as a precaution. But if he has to move, what becomes of the identity, the sovereignty, and heritage of a small island people? I was struck by the fact that Eleanor Roosevelt and her commission, who drew up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a declaration adopted by every country in the world, never imagined that human-induced climate change 
might force whole countries to go out of existence. Last September, I attended the third international conference of small island developing states, SIDS, on the island of Samoa. I've attended many UN conferences, probably far too many, but this one was unusual in the extent to which it was owned by the people of the island. They did everything they could to make us feel at home, to make it a success, from miles of bunting on every road as you traveled around the island, to new plantings, lovely plants to show what a beautiful island it was, and well-managed meetings where everyone felt they had a voice. The reason for the intense involvement was clear. Looking at the brackish water as sea level is rising, and visiting the parts of the island affected by a recent cyclone, you could easily sense the reality of the immediate threat posed by climate change, and other small island states are even more vulnerable than Samoa. The first point I'd like to make in giving the 2015 annual Grantham Institute lecture is that we're not on course for a safe world for millions of people, and even more seriously, for their children and grandchildren. We urgently need to change course and catalyze a transformation of the way we develop, the way we live, the way we do business. Our current system is flawed and unsustainable, and if it continues, the world is on course for catastrophic climate change and vast inequality. Let's turn this on its head and make it a positive, because we now know there are better ways of doing things that could shape a more inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and safe future for all. The transformative change needed because of the impacts of climate is our opportunity to work for a much better and safer world. I'm aware that I'm speaking to an audience that's knowledgeable on all aspects of climate science and policy. I'd like to talk to you about climate change from my perspective, which is one of justice, human rights, and fairness, where people and their right to development are at the heart of the discussion. I do so with humility, because when I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002, climate change wasn't front of my mind. I don't recall making any major speech on climate change or making any link between climate change and human rights. It was after that when I led a small organization called Realizing Rights, focused on economic and social rights in African countries, that I saw firsthand the negative impacts climate change was having on human rights, including the right to food, the right to health, the right to development, and the right to shelter. It was not the science and the graphs or the pictures of polar bears on ice caps that brought me to climate change. It was the impacts it was having on people's lives and people's rights. I met farmers, many of them women, unable to produce a harvest because the growing seasons had become so unreliable, and heads of state in African countries unable to plan their infrastructure because of the impacts of floods and storms. Everything seemed to be getting more difficult, despite the efforts to eradicate poverty and to make progress on the Millennium Development Goals. Climate change was the added complicating factor. In fact, for women in vulnerable situations, climate impacts can be devastating. In many homes around the world, women are at the heart of the household's nexus of water, food, and energy, and thus often know firsthand about the challenges and potential solutions in these areas. In our conversations with women around the world, we hear about their struggles, but also their ideas, many of which, if applied, could facilitate change. Women are the most convincing advocates for the solutions that they need, so they should be at the forefront of decision-making, which is why I always champion women's leadership in my work. So for me, climate change was never just a scientific or environmental issue. From my first experience, it was about human rights and development. The threats climate change posed to rights and development and the adjustment climate action requires to our existing models of development. This is why we focus on climate justice. It's motivated by the injustice of the impacts of climate change on the rights and opportunities of the people who are least responsible for causing the problem. And it's committed to making sure that the costs and the benefits of the transition away from fossil fuels are shared equitably. No one should be left behind as we make the transition, even if at present inequality is a characteristic of our world. 2015 is the year to catalyze a transformation, away from business as usual to a more inclusive, sustainable, and just alternative. 
This is because, as you know, 2015 is the year the world agrees on a new development agenda to succeed the Millennium Development Goals, a legally binding climate agreement to avoid dangerous climate change, and on the resources needed to implement both agendas on the ground in all countries. Seeds that were sown in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 will bloom this year and then continue to grow in the years up to 2020, 2030, 2050 and beyond. Rio is the birthplace of the international commitment to sustainable development. And one product of the Earth Summit in 1992 was the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. From its origins, the Climate Convention was an instrument of sustainable development. And not just, as some perceive it, narrowly focused on a, a, a multilateral environmental agreement. The commitments made to take action on climate change under the UNFCCC are critical to realizing sustainable development. 20 years after the Earth Summit in 2012, the world came together in Rio again to assess progress towards sustainable development and to determine next steps. The harsh reality emerged that no country had achieved sustainable development. Inequality had grown, poverty remained a challenge despite the MDGs, and the health of the planet and its ecosystems was deteriorating rapidly. From this realization, the idea for sustainable development go goals was born. These goals will be the successor to the MDGs, reorienting all development in all countries to be sustainable. And this is a very big deal. It really is a very big deal and part of the transformation to a different way of doing things. To make the Sustainable Development Goals work and be a reality, they will need to be financed and implemented by each country in response to their national context and in cooperation with other countries. And that's where the Financing for Development Conference in Addis Ababa in July comes in. It's about making sure that resources are available to implement climate and sustainable development actions in all countries in a way that's fair and inclusive. 2015 is a significant milestone on our quite long journey to a more sustainable model of development and a potential catalyst for transformation to a different and I believe better way of living on planet Earth. Key to maximizing the change we can affect this year is to realize that the 2015 agendas are mutually reinforcing and translate at the country and community level into the same actions. Unfortunately, we've tended to work on climate change and development in silos with different communities of experts and separate policy agendas. The fifth assessment report of the IPCC released last year refocused the climate community on the links between climate change and sustainable development. It reminds us that sustainable development is development that preserves the interests of future generations, that preserves the ecosystem services on which continued human flourishing depends, or that harmonizes economic, social, environmental development. And the report adds, and I quote, the climate threat constrains possible development paths and sufficiently disruptive climate change could preclude any prospect for a sustainable future. Thus, a stable climate is one component of sustainable development, end quote. The fifth assessment report also spells out the impacts climate change is having and will have on the enjoyment of human rights, including the rights to food, to water, to health, and to shelter. These impacts on people and their rights are a significant motivation for urgent action on climate change and have been noted by the Human Rights Council in a series of resolutions, and most recently, at a panel discussion on human rights and climate change in Geneva this March. The panel discussion focused on both the negative impacts of climate change on rights and the obligations of states to protect these rights, but also on the role human rights can play in informing effective climate actions and responses. This connection between human rights and climate responses links to points made by the IPCC on synergies and trade-offs between climate responses and broader sustainable development goals. And again, I quote, because some climate responses generate co-benefits for human and economic development, while others can have adverse side effects and generate risks. This acknowledges the potential risk to the right to development if climate action isn't shared equitably and if support isn't provided to developing countries to enable them to be part of the transition to climate resilient, low carbon development. 
The latest science makes it clear that the world needs to reach zero carbon emissions, we say by 2050. Some of you in the audience may want to uh, discuss that, but we really have looked at the science in my foundation, and I have a very good scientist leading our thought processes on this, and we believe that in order to uh, be sure that we will maximize the chances of staying below two degrees um, Celsius, that um, we need to, do, to uh, reach zero carbon emissions by 2050. This is ambitious and a significant departure from the way that we do business currently, but it's the only way, we believe, to stay within the remaining carbon budget. Research commissioned by my foundation looked at the equity and rights dimension of, the rapidly, of rapidly scaling up climate action needed to achieve this goal, while increasing adaptation action as even two degrees of warming will result in significant climate impacts. The research found that the risks to human rights from scaled up climate action are manageable. They're serious, but they're manageable and considerably less than the risks posed by uncontrolled climate change. However, to reduce unintended negative impacts on human rights from climate action, our responses must be informed by human rights and be fair, inclusive, and participative to shape policies and actions that deliver uh, for, for people and the planet. It may seem contradictory, but to be fair, all countries must be enabled to participate in the transition away from fossil fuels together and at the same time. If not, we will exceed the carbon budget and consign countries with, without the means to participate in the transition to renewable energy to a future based on expensive, obsolete, and polluting fossil fuels. So creating the conditions, legal, regulatory, financial, and political, for all countries to be part of the solution is key. And this is where climate finance and finance for sustainable development can play a role in catalyzing the transition which in turn needs to shift the trillions of dollars of investment worldwide to power the transformation. The new climate economy report produced by the Calderon Commission, on which Nick Stern um, is, a, is a member, finds that over the next 15 years, about 90 trillion US dollars will be invested in infrastructure in the world's cities, agriculture, and energy. This gives the world an unprecedented opportunity to drive investment in low carbon growth, bringing multiple benefits to jobs, health, business, business productivity, and quality of life. Like our work on zero carbon, zero poverty, the report finds that climate action and high quality growth are not just compatible, but that climate action is necessary for long-term prosperity. Importantly, the Commission stresses that countries at all levels of income can seize these opportunities, particularly if the 2015 processes send clear signals that we're departing from business as usual. I hope my voice still sounds sexy, doesn't it? <laughs> so what is required of the countries engaged in the international process this year? Leadership. Leadership by all countries, and the leadership given will differ according to a country's circumstances. No matter how big or small a country's economy or population, all actions count and should be counted in the international effort. That's why both the climate agreement and the SDGs are universal. Climate change and other symptoms of unsustainable development confront us with the reality of our interdependence. No country alone can protect their citizens from the impacts of dangerous climate change. All countries and citizens must act together, motivated by what we capture as enlightened self-interest. It's a very interesting concept. It's not as altruistic as solidarity, which has been reflected in earlier periods of, uh, of our work and in instruments like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But enlightened self-interest is quite a motivating um, uh, reason to uh, work together. Um, I worry about references to managing expectations in Paris because there's a danger this will lead to too low a level of ambition to point us on a different course. We need leadership and ambitious action by all countries. It's worth exploring the leadership different countries will have to give. Developed countries have grown wealthy based on fossil fuels. Their leadership is based on peaking, if they haven't done so already, and then rapidly reducing their emissions while making the transition to sustainable development. They also have an obligation to help developing countries to adapt to climate impacts 
and to make the transition to zero carbon development. To date, these obligations have, by and large, not been met, and as a result, have eroded trust and quashed ambition. Hence, a commitment to lead by, developing country, by developed countries is critical to success this year. The majority of developing countries are in a different situation, and so will give a different leadership. They're at an earlier stage in their development, and as a result, many have low levels of emissions. They will need to meet their sustainable development goals without using fossil fuels. In other words, they will have to develop using a different model to that which made the industrialized countries wealthy. This is a different prospect than merely reducing emissions and requires the absolute support of the international community. We have to remember that in our experience, no country has developed without fossil fuels to date. So cooperation is key to providing the technology, finance, skills, and systems to create an alternative way of developing. Emerging economies, for their part, face both leadership issues. Their emissions have grown rapidly, so they will have to determine a pathway to reduce their emissions. At the same time, they need development through renewable energy to lift their people out of poverty, which again must be supported with finance and technology by the international community. As I've emphasized, it's in our collective self-interest to support this transition and this new model of development. As without it, we'll exceed the carbon budget and be forced to accept the consequences of a four degrees or worse world. And that world will be far more unfair and unjust than the one we live in now. So what I wonder, oh, I better, sorry. So what I wonder might stop us from making this transition and from seizing the moment in 2015. It may sound idealistic, but in fact, this is what science informed us we must do. Um, we have to stay true to the science. That's also the climate justice way. It will be hard, but it's doable and affordable. It does pose risks, but it also opens up opportunities to do things better. Why, I wonder, are we so wedded to business as usual? And why are we so scared of change? Is business as usual so successful that the risks of moving away from it are too great to take? I don't think so. Business as usual has resulted in dangerous levels of pollution, caused climate change and bio biodiversity loss, and has failed to eradicate poverty and inequality. The current system is deeply dependent on and influenced by fossil fuels. The decisions governments, municipalities, and people around the world make every day are affected directly and indirectly by the price of oil and other fossil fuels. This is illustrated in the IMF's um, annual World Economic Outlook, which has just come out, which focuses on the opportunities and threats from oil and not on the risks of climate change and the opportunities of climate action. Business as usual, with fossil fuels as the foundation of the global economy, is the dominant discourse, but it can be changed with the transformational leadership I spoke of a moment ago. I believe a zero carbon, climate resilient pathway to prosperity is more likely to support the right to development than business as usual, especially for countries that are still development, de developing and for whom development is their priority. Carbon would ultimately constrain development in the least developed and most vulnerable nations of the world as climate impacts lead to more poverty and greater inequality. In a transition to zero carbon and zero poverty, on the other hand, the potential benefits outweigh the risks with opportunities for developed and developing countries in terms of energy security, greater competitiveness, better health, decreased mortality, job creation, and greater resilience. My friend Sharon Burrow and her colleagues in the International Trade Union Confederation understand the benefits and the risks of this new approach. From their starting point of there are no jobs on a dead planet, the trade unions support ambitious climate actions and a just transition where no one is left behind neither the workers dependent on the fossil fuel industry, nor the people who are poor and live in situations vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. An ITUC global poll of the general public in 14 countries revealed that 73% of people want governments to do more to limit pollution causing climate change. Interestingly, in Brazil, South Africa, Russia, Italy, and India, 80% or more of respondents wanted action by their governments. A just transition looks to the opportunities for industrial transformation and new quality jobs in the green economy, as well as greater equality. There is less to fear from this path than a blind commitment to the one that we are on. 
Another driver for a new way of doing things is inequality, which I'm glad we are thinking about and talking about more. Research by Oxfam shows that the share of the world's wealth owned by the best of 1% has increased from 44% in 2009 to 48% in 2014, while the least well-off 80% currently own just 5.5%. Seven out of 10 people live in countries where the gap between rich and poor is greater than it was 30 years ago. When you add to this the numbers of people living in poverty, and we, we, we see a lot of figures quoted, I'll just give the figure that there were 2.2 billion people living on less than two US dollars a day in 2011, only a slight decline from the 2.59 billion in 1981, according to the World Bank. It becomes clear that business, the business as usual model of development we're so wedded to is not doing such a good job. It's worth recalling again that the actions we need to take to achieve sustainable development are the same actions we need to take to adapt to climate change and implement zero carbon development. So the decisions we take at the international level in 2015 are important because they will be translated into actions at the national level and because they send signals to the wider community, including investors, that we are headed in a new direction. And let's just be fully aware that this new direction is new for all countries. As I said earlier, no country has achieved sustainable development. No country has met its development objectives without using fossil fuels, and all countries are learning how to adapt to climate change. This means that there's great potential for cooperation and for countries to learn from each other and to support each other. And some developing countries are more used to adapting to climate, so they may have lessons for richer countries that haven't been buffeted to the same extent up to now. In this context, climate finance is a catalyst. It reduces the risks associated with climate impacts and the transition to low carbon development in developing countries and unlocks the potential for investment to flow in a new direction. The human rights framing for a new path to development is set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which states in Article 28 as follows. Everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. And as I sat beside President Tong of Kiribati and actually referred to those uh, words, he doesn't have the prospect of a social and international order which will allow his people to fully realize their rights they may even lose their sovereignty and identity, as I said. We haven't yet created this social and international order, and any hope of creating it in the future would be wiped out by uncontrolled climate change. But I think we could create an international order where all people realize their rights if we grasp the opportunities that 2015 presents. President Tong, in fact, said last month in Geneva, and I quote him, if there is a major challenge on human rights, that deserves global commitment, leadership, and collaboration. This is the one, the moral responsibility to act now against climate change." End quote. So I look forward to hearing your views and indeed working in the future with a number of you to make sure that we harness and deliver the moral responsibility to act. Now is not the moment to manage expectations or get cold feet. 2015 is the moment to catalyze a transformation and achieve the social order the Universal Declaration aspired to. Now is the time for climate justice. As Victor Hugo suggested in L'Histoire d'un Crime, greater than the tread of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come, and I believe that is climate justice. Thank you, thank you for your attention. <laughs> So Mary Robinson has kindly agreed to answer questions as long as her voice stands <laughs> up to it. So uh, please uh, come forward with your questions. There should be two roving microphones. So there's one just by you over there. Yes, okay. And there's a hand just ahead of you. Uh, hi, Mary. Thanks. Thanks very much for your talk. It was um, very inspiring. I, I just wanted uh, you to comment on one aspect of the climate finance um, framework, the Green Climate Fund. Um, at this moment, I'm worried by some aspects of it in terms of 
uh, that the bulk of the funding looks like it will come from private sources through the fund, um, and also that some countries like my own, Australia, are diverting aid funding away from uh, traditional aid uh, mechanisms through to the fund. Um, uh, so in, in going about your argument about uh, funding to both development and climate change, um, how would you say that this framework is working and would you say there's, um, I guess, important precedents for governments to put a significant amount of funding that they committed to back in Copenhagen um, in 2009? Cheers, thanks. Okay. Do you want to take one or two more, or will I answer that? Why, why don't you answer that, that okay. one, and then we'll see some more hands yes. coming up afterwards. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a question that uh, lets us probe a little more into finance, and in particular, as you mentioned, the Green uh, Climate Fund. Uh, I think the Green Climate Fund is an important development, but it was worrying to see how difficult it was to capitalise it to the minimum amount which the UN said was necessary, which Christiana Figueres said, um, would be necessary for the fund. It's now at about 10.4 uh, billion, um, million, billion dollars. Uh, it's not at all the scale of money that we're going to need. There's another commitment that was made, which is for the 100 billion a year um, from 2020. That is actually extraordinarily important as a trust builder. The commitment has been made, and I believe it has to be delivered. And it doesn't all have to be public money. There can be both public and private money to, to make that up, but it has to be not only uh, committed to in serious pledges at this stage, but we have to see the shape of it by this conference in July in Addis in order for there to be that level of trust between 194 countries to agree sustainable development goals and to agree a climate agreement. And you can see what the problem is for developing countries. If you look at the money they're spending on adaptation at the moment, out of their own budgets, it's huge. I mean, we can know it's huge for countries like the Philippines, but for very many uh, developing countries, this is a very big new price they have to pay to stand still in a way, just to, to cope with and adapt to uh, the threats. And, and they do feel they haven't been primarily responsible and they didn't have the time to build up their economies based on fossil fuel that other parts of the world um, have had. So um, I, I think there is a worry among uh, a number of leaders of developing countries that uh, there will be um, some diverting of money away from the aid budget, you touched on that, um, that uh, there, there isn't the, the full commitment. I think this is a really serious moment. And then the new climate economy uh, talks about the 90 trillion that will be available over the next 15 years for um, cities and agriculture and, and, and energy, for infrastructure. Uh, so there, there, the, the importance, I think, of the 100 billion is that it will um, provide um, both trust and also leverage the larger sums. And what is encouraging is that uh, money is being pledged on the private side, um, uh, including at the climate summit for um, clean energy. Uh, in a way, uh, and I'm sure some of you would have even more um, uh, informed observations on this, the world is moving, and we're moving towards a renewable energy world. Um, it's not being fully captured in the rather clumsy UNFCCC process, but that process is vital to give us the right signal. It has to also um, ensure that there is a long-term goal and a review built into the process, because we won't be ambitious enough probably by December we'll need to increase that ambition um, over time. But everything depends on there being a much more serious commitment to the financing that um, is needed. Um, I've, I've, I've been in Korea and, and went to see the staff of the Green Climate Fund. Um, it's an important step, but we can't look to too much at the moment. The staff is relatively small. They make their first allocations probably next October. Um, uh, the, 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 the 100 billion won't all go into the Green Climate Fund. It can go in different ways, but it has to be there as public money inducing also some private money. And the, uh, there was the report of the advisory group to the Secretary General um, of various possibilities that might be available, and that sat on a shelf until now. It needs to be dusted down urgently, and we need to look at innovative ways of financing, because otherwise I would fear that we may not get the decisions that um, we, we vitally need, and future generations won't thank us if we miss the opportunity this year. Right, two more then. Um, 
and one on the inside of that row there, the far side from you, yes. Um, do you think it's acceptable for world-leading scientific institutions to continue to hold investments in fossil fuel companies? <laughs> I thought that question <laughs> might come up. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, and over here, a Guardian reader somewhere, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Definitely. over here. Um, mine is a totally different question. I very much liked your idea of regarding trying to limit climate change as one of the pillars of, for sustainable development. You wouldn't like to underline what you think the other key pillars would be of sustainable development. Okay, okay. so those two. Yeah, okay. Uh, I suppose I could begin um, my response to the first question by saying you heard the response from quite a lot of the audience. I think the divestment, and I always call it divestment investment, reinvestment um, cam campaign and, and, and the issues related to it, um, is uh, gaining traction. And I'm glad that it is because we do need to have pressure to move away from dependence on fossil fuel, from this business as usual um, that I described. Um, I, I, I believe it has to be uh, planned and uh, that um, if scientific institutions at least have considered the issue and have a plan to move to be entirely renewable, I could live with that for a while. Um, it's if, they, if, they, if they're not even thinking about it that it's much uh, more uh, to, to be criticised. Um, I had the opportunity to be with Sharon Burrow, who's a good friend, the um, uh, General Secretary of the ITUC that I quoted earlier, and she has a concern about too drastic a move in certain sectors out of fossil fuel, which could mean that workers in those industries um, could, could suffer very significantly. And that's why she uh, rightly talks about a just transition. And she makes the point that workers in the fossil fuel industry actually built a lot of the wealth that countries benefit from. And so I think we need uh, a very thoughtful, considered discussion of this, but in the context of moving out of fossil fuel. I quite often uh, quote the various reports now that we've had that we have to leave two-thirds of the known fossil fuel resources in the ground if we're to stay below uh, two degrees Celsius. I think that has to uh, focus the minds. I'm glad that um, the, uh, I think the European Central Bank is now thinking of following the Bank of England um, on uh, getting uh, corporations to assess their risk. And there are various other ways in which it's possible to raise these issues and make sure that um, institutions, universities, whatever, are thinking about their responsibility in that context. And then the sustainable development. Um, well, uh, I participated in the Rio Plus 20. I wasn't at the original Rio. It, um, I was president of Ireland at the time, and it wasn't appropriate and that, I would, that I would take part. But um, uh, I, I found it very interesting in the uh, high-level reports, if you like, leading up to Rio, uh, the criticism of the fact that we had not uh, been true to what Rio was, was, was meant to be at the beginning, and that was truly sustainable, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And you have to have all three of those working together visibly in order to have sustainable development. Um, I've seen some criticism of the 17 um, sustainable development goals and the 169 targets that are there as being very unwieldy. Um, I'm not so sure. I think uh, uh, that that seems to be an agreed agenda globally that has been worked out in a careful way. Twelve of the 17 goals, including the goal 13 on climate, relate to climate change, will have a significant impact. And I think it will bring together these two worlds that should always have been closer together. Um, climate change is inseparable from sustainable development. And uh, there's a timing issue which is very interesting as well, because... Uh, as you know, countries are preparing their intended nationally determined contributions to how they will reduce emissions, and some countries want to also include adaptation and other issues. Um, but they've all committed under the, um, uh, uh, under the UNFCCC process to lodge these INDCs, and 34 countries have so far done it, the countries of the European Union, um, the United States, Russia, Mexico, etc., and uh, Switzerland was the first, in fact. And um, they won't come into effect until post-2020, from 2020 on. That's the commitment. 
but the Sustainable Development Goals will come into effect on the 1st of January 2016. And all of us, the countries of the European Union, will have to look again under those goals at how sustainable we are and what we're doing. Um, so I do believe that there's a possibility of at last moving to true sustainable development and using uh, the goals and indicators and the fact that every country has to go through this process. It's not like the Millennium Development Goals. Um, all uh, the seven goals were for developing countries. The eighth goal, the commitments um, to, to fund it to, to reach the 0.7% were for the richer countries, which um, the United Kingdom um, has, has delivered on and I, 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 I hope will keep that standard. And um, other countries still have to work, to work towards that. But um, uh, I think we're now getting to a stage where we, we, we may understand sustainability. I've learned, and I had to learn it, that in the financial world, sustainability has a completely different meaning. So I was fooled for a while by references to sustainability in some of the, it's not the same at all. And um, uh, we have to be very careful. They're not nearly into sustainable development in the way they need to be, some of them. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so lots more hands up. There's one over here. And then at the back there on your side, yep. And I've seen your hand on come, yep, okay. We'll have one of you now and one later, right? So uh, you won't be out. All right, so on this side first this time. Uh, Mary, hello. Um, Liz Sutton from Climate Social Network. Um, given how um, difficult it's been so far to reach international agreement on climate change and to fully achieve the uh, Millennium Development Goals, I wonder how important you think it is that uh, individuals and communities um, should be taking action in their own communities to, to get on uh, with reducing emissions and uh, um, doing what they can to achieve climate justice yeah. whilst waiting for the governments to catch yeah. up with us. Right, and over there, yes. Yeah, um, it's been observed in the lead up to Paris, uh, in comparison with Copenhagen, that non-state actors, particularly the private sector, companies and investors, uh, are playing a much bigger role um, as they can and, and have to. Um, but how can that process be managed to ensure that it, it is done with the central concepts of inequality and, and development in mind? Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Again, these are all very good and informed um, questions. Um, I often say, I didn't say it um, this evening, but I often say that um, the whole issue of climate change is far too important to be left to the political leaders and the negotiators, and that, in fact, it's an issue for all of us. Uh, we all have children, in my case, grandchildren, and we, you know, we have um, a sense of uh, the existential threat that is posed by climate change. But, in fact, I think there is a, an openness now um, to... Uh, recognizing the importance of what is being done at local community level, city level, um, sub-national state level, and that's very welcome. It began during last year. It was highlighted very much during the climate summit. It was influenced, the climate summit itself, I think, was influenced by the um, huge march in New York, and there were events, I know, um, all around the world. I took part in that New York march, and it was just an exhilarating experience to be in the streets of New York in the sunshine, it was quite hot, um, with 400,000 people, we could barely move, all of whom wanted to be there, and wanted to be there with everybody else. And everybody had different signs and placards. Um, I actually was with Gru Brundtland. We were there as elders with our particular sign, and we had a little group around us. But I saw a sign, I've remarked on this before, I saw a sign a little bit away that I would have loved to have gone behind, which was a big sign saying, angry grannies. <laughs> and, you know, we need angry grannies in every place and angry grandfathers and, um, you know, people who really understand the need um, for action. And um, I'm going to tie this in with the second question about um, the fact that uh, companies and investors seem to be playing um, a, a bigger role and they need to play a role, but is this now something that can be um, looked at carefully to make sure it's fair and equitable, basically? Um, I think there's no doubt that uh, the Climate Summit began a process um, of uh, looking to the private sector um, to give more leadership and to look at its own carbon footprint and to take initiatives in sectors, take initiatives um, on carbon pricing and so on. And um, the president of the conference in Lima, uh, uh, Manuel uh, Pulga Vidal, 
uh, had the sort of, uh, sort of sense that it would be good for his COP, which it was, to have a climate action day. And I actually participated in that action day. And it, it was a good mix between heads of delegations who had been negotiating and um, business, indigenous communities, um, community generally, you know, so, and uh, actually for once listening to each other. And it, it was very energizing. And that is now uh, confirmed in the road to Paris, if I could call it that, which um, is being stewarded by both Lima, which retains the presidency until uh, we get to Paris, and, and the French. And they have a, a sort of action plan to get to Paris called the um, Lima Paris um, Action Plan. And it fits the structure that uh, the French have decided on for the climate um, summit um, in December. Uh, they've decided that the summit will have four pillars. And the first pillar is the actual legal agreement, which must be concluded and on which negotiations are, um, uh, are, are going to be resumed in June um, in Bonn. And there, there needs to be um, a good binding um, important legal agreement, which hopefully, as I said, will have um, a um, long-term goal and review in it, which will be the real way in which we can ensure that we're on a pathway to staying below two degrees Celsius. The next band then is the in in intended nationally determined commitments, um, which uh, won't be viewed as binding in the way that hopefully the legal uh, uh, commitment will be binding, because it's hoped that governments will actually increase their ambition and, and when they realize that there's uh, a need to do so. And the third band is um, finance and technology. And the fourth is all the other activities, um, uh, the activities of cities, the activities of the forestry community, the uh, forestries, and the New York Declaration on Forestry and the Lima um, strategy, um, bringing that forward, work on carbon pricing, work on um, investment in renewables, work on energy, um, all of these will be, and there's even work on a kind of loose way in which these can actually be categorized, you know, fitted into a grand plan for Paris. And that would be very interesting to see. And that will help uh, to augment, at least, the fact that the intended nationally determined commitments of, of, of governments are not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, we, we've not seen the political ambition that we need to see. Um, but at least we're seeing a baseline on which we can try to um, help to, to raise the ambition. Right, some more, yes. Right, there was one back there, I promise, just on the, on the edge of the road. Yep, okay. Okay, there's another one further back there. And uh, over here. I think he got it. <laughs> okay, right, right, he got it already. Yep. Right, over there then. Yes, thank you for your talk. Um, there's always talk of zero uh, carbon uh, emissions. And I'm just wondering at your level and uh, your foundation if there's any talk about zero population growth. And if not, what are some of the tricky aspects of that? And if there are those conversations, what are some of the organizations, NGOs, uh, that may be uh, having fruitful conversations from your perspective? Right, and let's have a second question from over there then. Is that the lady back there? Okay, right, we have, we have three questions for you this time, I think, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Is it okay to go? Okay. Okay. Um, my question is what you just alluded to, actually, just then, um, the political um, commitments that we need. So, to what extent do you think the short-termism of our governments in the West, or the developing world, so looking at four or five-year uh, government terms, is significantly hindering our um, commitment to planning and, and thinking about climate change, which needs ultimately very long-term plans. I mean, China gets a lot of abuse for, for what it does, so a lot of the pollution that's happening in China, and by no mm. means has it got a holistic mm. approach to climate change sorted at all, mm. but China can plan 15 years in advance, and there are some incredible policies that it started to put into place. So my question is, do you really think we can do it in the developing world, sorry, the developed world, considering we have such small, okay. such short government terms? Mm. Right, thank you. And the third question then, the lady with the microphone. Hello. This actually picks up quite well on the previous question, and I was very pleased to hear your use of the phrase zero carbon climate resilient pathway, because it brings to mind some work that I was doing with some of the NGOs about five years ago in advance of Copenhagen, 
where we proposed that all countries should be doing zero carbon action plans which would lay out the trajectory to decarbonisation by 2050, indicative decadal targets, and five-year commitment periods. Now, we did get language on that in the UNFCCC in Cancun, that developed countries should, and developing countries should be encouraged to do such plans. But it seems maybe that 2015, this is an opportunity to bring together the agendas of the SDGs as well as the UNFCCC, because it seems to me that we've moved away from a very strongly multilateral process, much more to a national level implementation. And it seems 2015 is an opportunity to beef up the UNFCCC and the language that we got in Cancun on that, to shape the overall targets, to set the legally binding framework that you were talking about earlier. But in the SDGs, it feels that this is a space where we have a lot of room to talk about the implementation. And I understand that there are conversations going on now what should be the indicators for the goals that have been agreed. And maybe one of the key things that we need to be working towards this year is getting carbon indicators for the relevant goals, such as infrastructure, energy, forest, transport. And if that can be integrated in national <coughs> level planning, that may be the space where the UNFCCC and the SDGs can truly come together to create sustainable development. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Again, three interesting and, uh, uh, questions. Um, in a way, I'm interested at the question about um, population and uh, it, it comes up at almost every climate meeting that I'm at and it's very interesting because it's clear that we are going to move from a, a world of some 7.2 billion people to about 9 billion, maybe more than 9 billion um, by uh, 2050. But the, uh, the way in which we talk about population is extremely important because we have made mistakes in the past of talking about population control, of having various um, interventions. We actually know exactly what will help to reduce the population in the best possible way, and that is educate girls and women and have health systems that reduce um, both uh, maternal and child mortality. And it is amazing when you do that and look at different countries how uh, the population settles into a much more um, uh, orderly a number, if you like. I remember uh, I went to Somalia as um, Irish head of state in 1992, and I was asked to go back there in 2011 when there was again famine in Somalia by the Irish aid agencies, and I, I went with them. And I just thought I'd make it an exercise quietly, because there's a question you can ask any woman in uh, that kind of context without it being difficult. Uh, sometimes I had to ask through translation, but I just asked every woman that I was encountering um, both in Somalia and in the Dadaab camp um, in, in Kenya, the, the huge camp, um, how many children do you have? And not a single woman said less than six. In some cases it was eight, nine, because they would hope that one or two would survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of the, the and so I think we, we, we um, it's very clear that um, this um, issue of population settles itself when um, education and health are available and um, it can therefore um, be part of sustainable uh, development in that sense. Um, on the issue of the problem of short-termism, uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that you're going through an election process in this country, so <laughs> I mustn't, mustn't say anything that would... Uh, but um, th there is a, a short-termism um, uh, built in, in some ways, to our democratic way of um, electing, and that, and that can be a problem. But actually, I think that's what's interesting about the INDC process. Um, it's a process that's requiring every country to say, what will I do in 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050? So it's actually encouraging countries, large and small, to, um, uh, to go through that process and, and to commit. And then we'll be able to see that um, it's unlikely at this stage, I think it's estimated, that it will put us on a safe, clear pathway um, to below two degrees Celsius. So we will have to um, uh, ratchet, ratchet up the ambition, which is why we need the long-term goal and the review process built into to that formal um, agreement. But it does mean that we have to think about it. You're, you're right that work is being done at the moment under the SDG process on indicators, and it is possible to inject um, some um, elements into it. I, I, I have a feeling that um, there is a strong sense that the Sustainable Development Goals have gone through quite a, a long process, the Open Working Group, they've been approved by the General Assembly, they've now gone into negotiation, and that actually 
there isn't very much um, likelihood of any significant change. Um, I think I heard a wise comment when I was in New York recently and uh, learning a bit more about the, the process there. Ireland happens to be a co-facilitator of that process with Kenya. And the wise comment was that actually developed countries should listen to some of the developing countries that have had experience of the Millennium Development Goals and shouldn't try for perfection up at the top level because it all depends on what happens in implementing um, on the ground. And I thought it was, it was kind of a wise mm. comment. I mean, that uh, uh, developing countries have been more familiar with this process of um, uh, using the Millennium Development Goals within their development system. And uh, so I, I do think that it will be um, a very interesting um, idea that all countries will have to, as of 1st of January 2016, embark on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. All right, some more questions. Yes, maybe, maybe last coming. round. <laughs> okay, last <laughs> round. All right, <laughs> have, a, have a good drink. We'll, we'll ask the questions slowly. Okay. okay. Right, I think there was one up at the back down there. And is there anything over this side? No, it's the last one. It's your last chance. <laughs> and there's a hand waving over there, so we'll make that the other one. Okay. There were a couple there. No, oh, well, there were a couple there. Well, I can't see them so well. Okay. <laughs> right, he's been waving his hand for a long time. I do beg his pardon. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Joni Pegram from UNICEF UK. Um, thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about this human rights um, and climate action initiative that was established by Costa Rica in February. Um, it's now a, an initiative that has 19 um, governments that have signed up to it and, and they've committed to promote language on human rights within the Paris Agreement. Um, obviously this is a very um, significant development potentially. I, I know that there's currently um, text on human rights in the, in the agreement in the draft. Um, what do you think the prospects are for retaining that language given sort of perhaps um, political opposition from certain countries? Um, because in terms of the alignment of policies and finance, et cetera, in, to be aligned with human rights consideration, I think um, considerations that would be very significant mm -hmm. if that could be retained. Thank you. Okay. And the second one. Uh, Robert Cochran, um, I'm uh, uh, a visiting professor here at Imperial in the transport department, but I work mainly on international transport, about which I've got two questions. We've talked about national uh, objectives, national targets, uh, but most, most of transport is footloose. It's international companies operating internationally, buying their fuels wherever they're cheapest and the taxes are lowest. And we also have the problem in trade in that it's very easy for a wealthy service economy to export its carbon production to large manufacturing countries which have a manufacturing base like China. How do we deal with these two issues? Right. Okay. Here for the last one. Right. Um, well, um, perhaps I'll deal with the transport one first because I want to um, end on a human rights note. <laughs> um, uh, I have to say that um, what I have learned about um, transport and climate um, has been very much as a member of the European Climate Foundation, which has put a lot of effort into uh, work in that area. And of course, it, it goes beyond national uh, uh, boundaries. And we need, uh, we actually need sector-wide approaches. Um, uh, and uh, the, one of the successes which the European Climate Foundation has helped to put forward is in the chemicals area um, to get um, agreed reductions of emissions while still having a very effective and competitive chemicals industry in Europe. And I think that that's probably the way to go, but it's not my area of particular expertise, so I, I don't think I can add to or even um, uh, uh, you know, in any way um, comment effectively on that. But I do know a little about the uh, Costa Rica initiative in Geneva. It actually happened during an event which my foundation and the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights had organized the evening before the ADP discussions were to take place in Geneva. They were from the 8th to the 11th of, uh, of, of February, and our event was on the evening of the 7th. And it was uh, a, a big surprise because I was closing the meeting as one of the co-hosts when I was told that the ambassador of Costa Rica 
wanted to say something. And I assumed, because I had literally more or less um, uh, finished the meeting, I assumed that what she wanted to do was thank us on behalf of the guests or something. But no, she said, I think we should, having listened to what you've done, you brought the delegates from the UNFCCC um, process and um, the country's representatives on the Human Rights Council together. Because the meeting was in Geneva, we had the unique opportunity to have um, government representatives on the UNFCCC, government representatives on the Human Rights Council, sitting at the same table with other human rights experts and discussing, um, getting, you know, understanding that um, climate change has such negative impacts on human rights, and many of them understood that, but also understanding that incorporating um, human rights language effectively would help uh, avoid unintended consequences, or help actually to plan better climate mm -hmm. policy. And um, the ambassador was very taken with this, and she proposed that there should be what she calls the Geneva Pledge, and it's now been called the Geneva Pledge, uh, where countries at national level would agree to bring together their climate and human rights representatives and to engage in a kind of dialogue within the country to make sure that they understood the situation. And um, as you say, 18 or 19 countries had, um, 18 countries at least had signed before we left Geneva, and I know some other countries have also agreed to it. It's a voluntary uh, commitment, but it's important because we did see during the ADP meeting in Geneva, uh, human rights language inserted into um, the uh, 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 draft elements of the text that will now be negotiated um, for uh, the uh, Paris Agreement. And we also saw strong gender equality language, which wasn't there before. That's now in the text. It will be important, I believe, that both human rights and gender equality language remain within the text because it's such a signal of a way of doing. Um, it has a significance for how you think about it. It, it brings out the moral dimension of, of, um, uh, of climate change for a start. So we were very pleased indeed. We helped with the Office of High Commissioner and my colleagues helped draft the text of the Climate Pledge and we were very pleased to see it being taken up in a small way. I think we're getting, we're getting out of silos. You know, um, I, it's been my experience working in the UN um, as High Commissioner for Human Rights and more recently um, I was special envoy for the Great Lakes in Africa before I took on the, um, uh, before the Secretary General appointed me as his special representative on uh, climate change, that um, uh, UN agencies and governments deal in silos on different issues. And they're experts that go to one conference, don't talk to experts in another, and um, finance ministries don't get involved and so on. And I think that's probably why, I've reflected quite a bit on this, that's probably why, until very recently, climate change was thought about as being um, a scientific and environmental issue, and not a development and human rights issue at all, and not really a people-centered issue to the extent that it should be, because it was a process driven by the representatives of countries who were scientists, who were um, uh, energy experts, who were environment experts, and they were in their bubble, if you like. Now, I think it is really good that in 2015, we have the Sustainable Development Goals and the Climate Agreement that are two sides of the same coin. Maybe the finance, financing for development is the, is the link between them um, to have real sustainable development. And um, as we, we now recognize for the first time, for a world that desperately needs the hope that comes from that and the, um, the possibilities for a much better future. And I love the idea that so many uh, students have come this evening because it's your world. You have to help us to make sure that uh, we motivate, you know, we, we mobilize as much as possible during this world and we get the word out. 2015 is, in my view, one of the most important years since 1945 that gave us the Charter of the United Nations and the Bretton Woods Institutions and the Marshall Plan for Europe. So this year we have financing for development, sustainable development goals, and a climate change agreement that are of that order of importance for future generations. Not that they will solve all the problems, but they'll send the right signals, and that's so important. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is James Sterling. I'm the provost here at Imperial College. And I'd like to thank you, Mary, for such an interesting and inspiring talk, and indeed for finding the time in your extraordinarily busy schedule uh, to visit Imperial College this evening. As Brian has said, the Grantham Institute annual lecture is undoubtedly one of the high points in the college's calendar, and we're honored by your presence with us this evening. It is very pleasing and surely no coincidence to see such a great turnout this evening, and I extend a particularly warm welcome to those of you visiting the college for the first time. You have planted a number of powerful thoughts in our mind. Climate change is not just an issue of atmospheric science, not just thought experiments, about the impact of temperature rise on wildlife, sea levels, polar bears, ice caps, extreme weather events, and so on. It is also about fundamental human rights. And this, more than anything else, is what should be motivating us all to find urgent and equitable global responses to the climate crisis. It's urgent because we are, in a sense, already out of time. You've also impressed upon us that while scientists such as those working here at Imperial, tell us that the tipping point is a two degree warmer world. For many people, and typically the most vulnerable, their tipping point has already come. And thankfully, the world does seem to be waking up. You mentioned the United Nations Summit for the adoption of the post-2015 development agenda in New York in September, followed a couple of months later by COP21 in Paris, these will frame discussions and policy on the missions to stabilize the climate and eradicate poverty over the coming years. You and your colleagues in the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice are undoubtedly and thankfully key players in this debate and we wish you every success. World leading universities like uh, Imperial College London also have an important role to play in our case with a particular responsibility to discover and to communicate the hard science, engineering, medical and business evidence that is needed to underpin policy. And finally, in a, what, probably a poor attempt to paraphrase what I took uh, to be the key message uh, from your talk, zero carbon and zero poverty. It may be hard, but it is doable and affordable and it must involve all of us. Mary, thank you again for such a truly inspirational talk. And ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to show your appreciation for our speaker in the usual way? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.